to present uh, today. So this talk is called an overview. There's many features uh, in NIM, and so I can only outline what, what is available and what, is, uh, uh, what exists. You can see, uh, find the slides on, on GitHub, and of course there's the NIM-Lang uh, website that has the, the manual and all the documentation and installation uh, instructions, etc. Okay, so NIM is a new systems programming language, and when we say systems programming language, we mean we mostly two things. One thing is that uh, you need to have a good control over the, the memory layout. So if I have an array of rectangles that should be packed in memory, and there shouldn't be any hidden pointers or indirections involved. Um, the second feature that's essential for systems programming is that there is a bitcast operation that you can use to convert pointers to integers and back because that's a, a, an essential feature if you need to implement your own memory manager or your own garbage collector. And so that's exactly what we do. We, pro, we programmed a NIM, the, the, a garbage collector for NIM and a, a memory manager and NIM gives you both manual memory management and garbage collection. Um, we do this by compiling the NIM code to C and C++ and also to JavaScript. So it's really quite portable. And um, the garbage collector is uh, attached to a thread. So every thread has its own heap, which is garbage collected. And asynchronous message parsing is used between uh, these uh, threads for interactions. And so a thread doesn't have to wait for other threads to be able to collect its, its working set. And so there are, this is, uh, enables us to, to give um, soft real-time guarantees. So there's a mode in the garbage collector where you can say, okay, now you are allowed to run, but only for half a millisecond, for example. And um, then the GC stops after this uh, period of time. And, uh, but still is able to collect something, and uh, this is very handy for your uh, critical render loops, for example. Yeah, and apart from that, the design goals were to be to have an efficient, expressive, and elegant language. Um, and this is actually the order of priority. So first of all, we want to, the code to run efficiently at runtime. And, but if it doesn't hurt uh, runtime performance, we want to have expressive code. And this means that we want to have a, a macro system uh, like LISPASS, for example. So my goals were to, to design a language that is as fast as C, as expressive as Python, and as extensible as Lisp. And um, so Python was the major influence uh, on the syntax, we will see in a moment. Um, the, the macro system that NIM offers was inspired by Lisp, and we try very hard to, to compile to efficient C code, so there's not uh, much overhead uh, when, uh, uh, in comparison to when you write the C code by hand. NIM is used for web development, the website the NIM website runs on, on it. We have a forum that is written in NIM that uh, uh, runs on the website. It's used for, for a few commercial games that are upcoming already. Um, we use it for the compiler, so NIM boot, boots can, can bootstrap, so the, compiler is, the NIM compiler is written in NIM too. Uh, there have been a couple of experiments to, to use it for operating system development. Um, and because the language has a strong support for operator overloading and it's efficient, it's very good when you need to work with, with vectors or tensors, and so it's very interesting for scientific computing. And uh, yeah, most tools are, are written in, in NIM too because the, the language is so uh, concise and nice to work with. For example, the, the, the script that performs the bootstrapping is also a, a NIM program. Okay, so it's a very good general purpose language. So let's see some code. This is hello world. It's, uh, that's it, so that's a top level statement that is run uh, at, at program startup. And you would uh, 
compile and run it with this command. So nim c compile and the dash r, the dash r uh, stands for uh, run the, the produced binary afterwards. Okay, so this is uh, unfortunately a very short program where you cannot really see how nim looks like. So I've prepared a, a, a more elaborate example um, where you should just to get a feeling about for, for the syntax. So uh, we use indentation to, to delimit the, the um, statements. And um, so this is a function. It's called a, a proc, which is NIMS fancy word for function that uh, takes in a number in the range one to 3,999 and produces the, the Roman representation of this number. For example, 1,009 would produce MIX. Um, so there are a couple of things to, to notice here. First of all, we have this uh, in the curlies and with the colons, we have an, a dictionary literal but it's not like in Python where it's converted into a hash table immediately, but instead it's, it's kept as a list of key value tuples. So the order is kept. So I can use this and pass it to an order dictionary collection later on and the, it, it works because the, the order hasn't been lost. Um, another uh, thing to notice here is that the, since it returns a string, we have a result variable that's uh, implicitly declared for us. And um, we set it to the empty string in line eight, and then we append to this string in line 13. Okay, so and the, the details of the, the algorithm are not that important. Um, but I said, let's see if it works. Um, oh, I think. Um, so we save this as, as Romans nim, and then I want to uh, compile and run it. And um, yes, it produces MIX. So the, the question is what happens if the, if, if the number is not uh, within the range. So the, the Romans were very bad with numbers. They could only count to 300, three. 1,999. And so now the, the compiler says, uh, I cannot convert this uh, 4,009 to this uh, subrange at compile time. Okay, but um, if I store the value in a, in a variable, then the compiler does not know that it's out of range. And then uh, it produces a, an exception at runtime instead and says, okay, this is out of range. Okay. Um, now I will talk about more about the syntax so that we can look at more complex uh, code examples. So function application looks like in um, almost every other programming language, you can pass zero arguments to the F, one argument or two arguments. And then there's lots of sugar to write the same. So, I can say my string dot len instead of length of my string, so that to give it an uh, object-oriented feeling. Um, so this is one rule. You can use the dot notation for convenience. The other rule is that you can leave out the parentheses. Um, and the, the third rule that's in the last line in this table tries to show that we have the idea of a generalized string literal in the language. So if you know Python, you know that you can put an R between, before the quotes to disable the, um, the backslash escapes. And we can do the same, but we expanded this idea. And instead of an R, you can use any identifier, for example, RE, to construct a regular expression. And um, so this means pass this string literal to the RE function, but don't interpret the, the backslashes uh, here. So backslash B is the word boundary of the regular expression and not the, um, the, the ASCII backspace. So the idea is that this, this mechanism is enough for us to, to, to have a really good support for regular expressions, even though they are not built into the language. 
There's one exception uh, from these rules, and that is that you cannot write f instead of call f. So if I say my array dot map of f means pass the function f to the map and not call f and pass the result to the map. So for, uh, functions are first class in them. Um, I said we have really good support for operator overloading. NIM goes so far that uh, to allow you to define your own operators, for example, an at. And um, you can use then the, the operator symbol and backticks to, to treat it like an ordinary identifier. But of, but of course, usually you use the uh, infix or prefix notation for, for an operator. So here I have an example that, that uh, shows how this works. So I define my own plus plus operator that takes a, a variable x, var int means it's uh, passed by ref, so I'm allowed to modify the x. And uh, then it takes a y and a z, defaulting to, to one and zero. And then I add up these numbers and store the result into the x. And now I can invoke this operator in, in prefix notation. So plus plus g means pass the g as the x, and y and z get their default values. Or I can say g plus plus seven, which means pass the seven to the y, the g to the x, and for z use the default value. And there is no syntax to, to call this operator with three arguments, so I can resort back to the, the backticks notation. And if I'd like to, I can also use the dot backticks. Um, okay, apart from, from var, parameters, uh, other parameters are read-only within the body of the procedure. We have the usual control flow statements in NIM. We have if, we have case, we have when. The difference between if and when is that when is evaluated at compile time, and the compiler says, uh, I cannot evaluate this condition at compile time um, when it cannot. We have the defer statement inspired by Go for uh, a bit more convenient try finally handling and the for statements, uh, etc. We ha still have a distinction between expressions and statements in the language because we, are, we have an indentation-based syntax. And so we want you to intent, indent your statements because this improves the usability of the language. For example, it's clear that the else here belongs to the outer if, and thanks to this indentation-based syntax, that's what the compiler sees as well. So the compiler agrees with, with how you see your code. However, for, for expressions, we want a bit more flexibility. So we want to be able to split up long lines after a binary end operator, for example, or after a comma, or after an uh, open bracket. And so this is allowed as well, so it's quite flexible. And also if and case are available as expressions, so uh, it doesn't uh, lose any expressi expressivity. So if you are a functional programmer, you can be happy. Um, a few words about the type system. NIM is strict and statically typed. So statically typed means every expression has a type that we know of at compile time. Strict mostly means that we are very conservative with what kind of implicit conversions are allowed. For example, you cannot write if three because three is, a, is an integer and not a boolean. So you won't need to write if three is not zero or something like that. We then weaken the type system for the metaprogramming. Um, we will see an example of that just to, to help the programmer because it can be tedious to actually write, write out the types or even be impossible. Um, but this means, so for, for example, for macro invocations, the types might not be checked, but after the macro expansion, then the checking occurs. Um, we support subtyping via single inheritance, so you can say this object inherits from some root object. We also have subtyping in the form of the range um, construct that we've seen, and also there is a type natural, which is like, which is a subtype of int. So it's from zero to the highest value that's available for int. And um, 
So this natural is actually built into NIM in, into NIM's system module, which is like Haskell's Prelude. So it's always available for you, and you are encouraged to use natural rather than uh, unsigned integers, because natural it behaves properly when with with subtraction, for example. Um, we also have generics, so you can have a hash set of strings, and then we have concepts on top of that that are like. Uh, for, for the generic type system, additional constraints that you can, can write down as a concept. So in a way, it's a type system for the type system, uh, heavily inspired by C++. Um, we lack interfaces in the language. Instead, you can use a tuple of closures, which is the, the common workaround that has a bit more overhead, but they come up so rarely that it doesn't really matter. Um, we embrace the, over, the idea of, to, of overloading. For example, in NIM, the to string operation is so just the dollar, and it's, of course, predefined for integers and for booleans, etc. But, of course, you can then define your own dollar operator for your user-defined um, type, and it should still work with the existing dollar operator. So we use overloading for that. And because of that, we... Uh, don't have any Hindley Milner type inference in the language because they Hindley Milner type inference doesn't really mix with overloading well. Then the type checking becomes NP complete. That means that this could be could take a long time to compile an code, and so we try to avoid this trap. We have uh, a limited amount of flow typing in the language. The idea of flow typing is that the types know the control flow of your code. So here I have a ref int. So ref int is a, an, a traced pointer, so it's subject to garbage collection. And the constraint, additional constraint is that it cannot be nil. And now I have an, a variable x of this pointer type, which can be nil. And I'm allowed to pass it to the f because I have this check here before it. So the, com the, the type uh, checking depends on how the how the control flow graph uh, looks. We also have an effect system in NIM. So the idea is that in addition to a type, a function can have an effect, like it reads uh, some I.O. operation or it executes something. And this is modeled as tuples. So the idea is that it's orthogonal. So I can have a return type. And separate from the return type, there is this uh, effect, the list of effects that the function might have. We'll see in a, an example. Uh, and roughly speaking, every effect is uh, inferred, and types are not if inferred, but it's, it's uh, uh, just uh, a rule of thumb. So we use the effect system to track side effects. The definition of side effects for NIM is access as a global variable. Or, of course, calls a function that might access a global variable. So there's some transitivity here. We also use it to track exceptions. So we can infer that your code can raise an I.O. exception. And then you can uh, explicitly annotate that you don't want that. And then the compiler checks against that. But it's all optional. So if you just want to use NIM to hack something uh, together, then it doesn't bother you. It's all uh, optional. We also track tags, like, as I said, is this a reading I.O. operation? Is this a writing operation? Does it have a time effect, which means does this operation in some way depend on the clock of your CPU, which is usually bad when you want to test something? And then we split it up. So you can also have, say uh, this reads from a directory, and of course, Exec I.O. effect is very important, so this means that you are allowed to run some shell scripts, for example. And this would have been very helpful, for example, to prevent the, the shell shock bug, which was caused by some script language parser that didn't really parse, but also execute code. So, okay. Um, we also use the effect system to track locking levels, so you, we can detect uh, deadlocks at compile time. And finally, we track GC safety. So the, the point here is since the, every thread has its own heap, 
you, you cannot have wild sharing between threads via global variables. And so this is what the GC safety means. That means uh, you, it, it, something is GC safe when you don't access a global variable that is subject to garbage collection. And now that the definition of side effect means you must not access any global variable, it's a, this, this nice property that if you don't have side effects, it's automatically GC safe. Um, so I have a very short example for the effect system. So in, in the curlies with the dots, this is the effect here. And usually it's inferred, but now I, I, I write it out. And the question is, does this compile? And um, it says no, uh, it can have side effects. Because we say, OK, the echo actually accesses standard output, which is a global variable, and so it's not allowed. But to, 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 we have a debug echo that hides the fact that it actually echoes, and then it type checks. OK. Um, some um, particular feature of NIM that I'm very proud of is the strict typing for enums. So this code uh, snippet was inspired by the compiler source code. In the, in, within the compiler, we have a complex virtual machine that is used to run uh, stuff at, co at compile time. And so it happens this, this functionality uh, features uh, beginnings of a sandbox. So I can say, I, I have an enum which de describes what uh, kind of restriction uh, should be applied. So I can say, allow the dangerous cast operator in the language, or allow the foreign function interface, which can also do uh, nasty stuff, of course. Or I can say, allow infinite loops. And then the, what, what can be passed to this function that runs some NIM code as a string is a combination of these flags. So I can say um, default, and so it's a set of these flags. So I can say uh, the default is uh, to allow the cast and to allow the foreign function interface, but do not allow infinite loops. Um, and this is uh, still strictly type safe. So now compare this to the C++ solution, where you, I, I made a typo here, so uh, incidentally, allow foreign function interface and allow infinite loops map to the same value. That's pretty bad. But of course, the, the real problem is that it's not type safe. Because what, what do I, what's the type of this flex in C++? It's unsigned int. So can I pass 700 to this? I don't think so. So it's a, it's a loophole in the type system. Uh, OK. So we have seen proc, which is function. There's also iterators in the language. So it's a quite a big language, actually. Um, templates and macros we'll see in the moment, which are the foundation for the macro system and the metaprogramming capabilities. We have methods that uh, introduce dynamic binding, which is required when you have inheritance. And converters can be used to extend the type system. For example, you can say, uh, I think it's fine to treat an, an integer like a Boolean, so I'm writing a converter that converts into Booleans, and then if three would, would type check if this converter is, is in your scope, actually. OK, so many languages now offer these, this null core scaling operator, so the double uh, question mark. Uh, and in NIM, we don't have to use it. We don't have to build it into the language because we have a macro system instead, and because we have user-definable operators. So here I have a template that says question mark, question mark. I don't care about the types, so I just say this is untyped and the result is untyped. Don't, don't bother me with types. Check it afterwards. And uh, of course, now I need to check if A is nil. And if so, I want to return B. Otherwise, I want to return the A. But since this is a template, is kind of like a define uh, in C, C's preprocessor. Uh, you need to watch out that the A is evaluated only once. And so I store it in a, in a let variable x here so that I can, can use it multiple times in a safe way. So the, the macro system is hygienic. This means that the local x here is not visible outside of the uh, expansion of this uh, quotation mark, quotation mark operator. 
and I don't need to care if, if, if there's some X otherwise in, this, in some uh, surrounding scope that could confuse the macro system. Um, yeah, and then I say I have a variable X of type string, so the default value for string is nil, so this would actually say, okay, I pick the woohoo instead and would print woohoo. Um, another thing that you can do with templates is to create domain-specific languages. Um, here I outline an idea of how to use templates to, to give us a domain-specific language that produces HTML code. Um, so I have a template called HTML and I pass main page as the name and uh, then with the colon and indentation is another syntax to, to pass a whole body of code to uh, the template. So this echo statement is then passed as the body. And since I want, don't want to be bothered with types, I can leave out the types here. So it's short for colon untyped. And so this template then produces a function of the given name that just runs the body but wraps it in this. HTML strings with the um, angle brackets. And now um, I can use this idea to, to create an HTML page. So if I have more templates like HTML head, title, body, URL um, templates, then this, this would uh, work. And the template head pretty much looks like the template HTML except that it doesn't introduce a new procedure, but just takes the body and wraps the body in the uh, head. And likewise for the title and li templates, and here is the, the percent is like in Python, the string uh, substitution operator, and so the dollar one is then replaced with this x here. Okay, and after we do perform all these uh, macro substitutions, the, the main page HTML would just look like NIM code that does a couple of uh, string operations. Now, the problem is with templates is that you cannot have an uh, iteration in a template. So you, in a template you write down what the expansion should look like. But um, if you need more than that, you need to switch from a template to a macro. And uh, these are much more powerful and Turing complete, but they are also harder to work with. Um, so I have an example prepared here, which is like I want a macro write line, like uh, I do, um, like it was uh, defined for Pascal, for example. And within the the macro, there is uh, I need to to use an API to construct these syntax trees. So to use the API, I need to import the module macros. And now the idea is that I, I, get, I get a file and some arguments, and I also need to, to give a return type. And um, so now I want every argument that uh, is passed to be, to be written out. And um, since NIM is uh, statically typed, it's and I wanted to, to work with a flexible list of arbitrary types. So I wanted to work with, for example, uh, integers and floats, and in this example, booleans. And now what happens is that within the macro, I can access these, these values, but they are as a syntax tree. And um, let's see if it runs. No, okay. What's the problem? Got into no more. Oh yeah, I, f I forgot the file, which I don't really use. So the implement. So I have like uh, statically typed helpers that are overloaded. So I have a write that can write an int. I have a write that can write a bool. I have a write that can write a float, and then I have write new line, which I want to call at the very end. And within the macro, I call these write uh, operations. And finally, after the loop, I call the write line. And uh, let's see if it works now. Yes, so it produces the 40, the 
uh, 40.0 and the false. Um, uh, and the, this macro here uses the API, so I can say I want, I, I, actually I return a list of statements and uh, the list consists of calling expressions, so I call this right with the, with the given argument. And this I have to do for every given argument. Um, okay. So um, I have another macro example that shows that you can actually implement currying in the language. So the idea is really to, to give you the, the building blocks to build it whatever you like but we don't want to build in too many things into the language, but instead give you meta tools to, um, to expand the language. Um, however, I think I will show the parallelism instead. Um, okay. So this is a simple example that shows how you can uh, introduce parallelism within this framework of uh, thread local heaps so the, the task is we want to count words. And I have a, a function that does count the words from the, for the given file. And it returns a count table ref, which is given by us from the nice tables module. And the, the ref suffix here reminds us that we are dealing with a pointer. Because as I said, usually you, uh, you deal with value-based um, data types in them. OK. So, and then we say we have a new count table of type string. And then we, we iterate over the file. We read the whole file into memory. And we say split it on the white space. And everything that is split uh, between white space is, does count as a word. And um, we, then we say to the count table, count this word and count just as the ink uh, function. And, and that's it, so that's three lines of code. Um, now the, the real task is that I have more than one file that I want to count, and this is the sequential version, so this is not uh, using NIMS parallel features yet. So I have some outer table tab that uh, is used to aggregate these, these counting results. And then I call this my, my count words helper function for every given file in this list. And uh, this returns me already a uh, tab two. And then I merge these results. And afterwards, uh, after I've counted every file, I need to sort this table and echo the, the largest uh, entry, which means this is, returns the word that is most frequent in this files data one to data four. Um, so this is the parallel version. So there's not much that you need to, to change. We use this uh, helper module thread pool, um, which gives us the spawn macro. So again, uh, macros are everywhere in NIM. And the spawn macro takes the task, like count words of f, and runs it on the thread pool, yielding a flow variable. So a flow variable is, a, is also called a data flow variable. And the idea is that you can write once to this variable and read many times, but the reading blocks until the result is available. And by construction, this means that you cannot have any data races. And since there are no locks, uh, you can also, you, you, you can't have a deadlock either. And um, so it's really convenient and safe to use. Now, um, there is this blocking read operation. This is spelled as a roof. And I need to watch out that I don't read too early. So if I just say spawn count words and would read here with a roof, this would mean that every parallelism is already killed because uh, it says, okay, run it on thread pool and then wait for it to come back. But the wait blocks, and so I'm, I've lost. Instead, I need to store these flow variables in some array. And after every task was spawned, I can collect these results. So this is the second loop here. And then again, I need to merge these results back into my actually, uh, actual result table. And again, afterwards, I need to, to sort and uh, 
then I can output the most frequent word. Okay, so this shows the, the high level API that NIM gives us for working with parallel uh, constructs. Of course, we also support the, uh, from POSIX, for example, usual locking and uh, condition variables. And there are also uh, a couple of features that try to, to make these constructs safer to use, but this is then the, the, low, the low level um, concurrency and parallelism stuff. So this is the high level view. And um, as I said, when you go to the low level with locking, there's uh, um, the effect system then that tries to, uh, that does ensure that you cannot have any deadlock in your system. Um, there's another short example. This is uh, computing pi in parallel. Um, so there's this formula that I won't go into that can calculate pi. And again, this is the usual thing that you do. You, you need to store all the flow variables in a, some sequence or array. You spawn the tasks that you, that you need. And afterwards, you need a, some, some collection um, loop that, that aggregates the results, and in this case, you, you, the aggregation is the sum of these um, sub-results, and this would compute pi. And the n uh, determines the, the precision. Of course, it's still bounded to the precision that you get when you use floating point in the first place. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. Um, we have got NIM stickers right here that you can uh, put on your laptop. Um, yeah, please check out these links. Um, we are on IRC as, as much as possible. And I've got also a bouncer, so you can ask me anything. And um, anything more? OK. So questions? Sorry? Tail recursion, no, we, um, we don't support tail recursion because we translate to C and C doesn't uh, support that properly. Um, there, there are a couple of ways to use iterators uh, to, to, uh, to get something like tail recursion, but it's, um, it's a messy business. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the idea is that we have few constructs that nevertheless uh, support all the paradigms out there, like functional, object-oriented, imperative style, and so this is the the uh, the point really that you can pick your own coding style, and but it it really is compatible to some other um, coding style in some other module. So that's why it's only syntactic sugar and not uh, trying to enforce some kind of semantics, for example. So we really like to decouple the syntax from the semantics to, to gain all this metaprogramming power. Yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, you have, I've shown you the, the null color scaling operator that otherwise would need to be built into the language if we didn't have this flexibility. Okay. Yep. Yes, I didn't show it, but we have channels to to message between threads. But um, yeah, so the thread pool has the spawn, which is like a one shot, it's like uh, do this and then come back later. But for more interaction with threads, you usually need a, um, a channel. Yes. We have a nimble package, package manager um, that's part of the standard distribution and there are lots of packages already available and so yeah, you can type nimble search for, I don't know, regular expressions or scientific computing and you will get some results, yes. Yes, we also have very good interoperability with C++ because we can generate C++ code. And so um, 
For example, you can also uh, interface with uh, WX widgets, for example, which is in C++, which we, we can access without a, a C intermediate step. So we can access directly the classes and the methods within this uh, framework. Okay, so enjoy your lunch. <laughs>